this, bro. Actually, let me tell you a story then, let's pray. <clears throat> About 20 years ago, uh, when we were still on the blue hall up the top there, and uh, I, had, I was leading a worship team at that stage, and we had just finished our worship practice, and Ray Oliver, Uncle Ray, for those of you, whatever you call him, came to me and said, Ed, can you come help me pray for some guy? So that sounded like a fairly simple request. So we went down to what is now, I think, somebody's office. The last office as you go down on the left before the team room. Whose office is that? Anyway. I'll tell you what happened in that office. So we go there, and um, Ray says, Ed, I just need you to help me pray with this guy, and he's, he's on drugs, but he's coming off drugs tonight. And so we start praying, and this guy's eyes go big, and then he falls on the floor, and he starts rolling around on the floor, and there's obviously some demonic stuff going on here, and I watch Ray go from Ray, as we know Ray, to on his knees like this, binding this thing, casting it out, and he started off saying, look in my eyes, look in my eyes. And this guy looked in his eyes, his eyes were now big, changing color, which is why I don't like movies where I was, guys, every time I've ever seen somebody's eyes change color was because of a demon. I don't like watching movies where guys' eyes change color. That should not entertain you. That should freak you out. Anyway, so, so Ray says, look at my eyes, and I'm in, the, I'm in the three meters away praying in tongues like I've never prayed in tongues before, and just amen, yes, I'm agreeing with Ray, whatever Ray's doing. Anyway, we cast a demon out of this guy. This was about 20 years ago. And there were a number of things that were going through my head when I tried to fall asleep that night. Okay. One was, it was pretty freaky. I was, I was, that wasn't fun. It freaked me out what happened that night. Secondly, and this has never left me, it, it really got to me that somebody can be so bound. It really got to me that somebody can open the door to give the devil a, a, an aspect of their life where they can be that affected. And the third thing that got to me was how calm Ray was. I'm serious. Like, Ray had an absolute, I mean, he was strong, like, uh, I mean, he was, he was forceful, let me put it like that. He was authoritative, like I haven't seen Ray in, in too many other instances, but there was a calmness and a conviction, and a faith, and an assurance that Jesus was sovereign, and this guy would get delivered. That was beyond doubt. And that's what happened. Let's pray. Father, as we come to the end of this series on freedom, Father, if it's just a, a head knowledge, God, we have missed the point completely. So I pray, Father, please tonight, in the name of Jesus, that that absolute, complete liberty and freedom would be the portion of every single person here. I pray, Father, that a deep, convinced, assured relationship with you and an awareness of your Holy Spirit inside every single person, Father, would be the portion of everyone here tonight. I pray, Father, that if there be anybody here who does not know you, who does not hear you, who does not see you, that tonight that would all change, Father, please. Father, I pray that where decisions are needing to be made, where there are souls needing to be sealed, it would happen tonight, Father, please. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to only preach for 20 minutes. 
which used to be quite easy, but it's got harder the older I've got. And um, after that, I'm going to ask, uh, before we end the service, I'm going to ask all the elders, and I'm going to ask Rob and Aleph to come join us as well from Doha. And then we're going to pray for sealing to take place. For those of you that are, are needing this, for some for the first time, some multiple times, but God, it's like I need your fingerprint on me, good and proper. We're going to pray for that. Okay. Psalm 34 says this. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my mouth. I sought the Lord. Everybody say, I sought the Lord. And he heard me and he delivered. Don't have to say that part. Just say, I sought the Lord. And he heard me. And he delivered me from all my fears. It says, it says, those who look to him, everybody say, look to him. You guys on this side, look to him. Everybody, those who look to him. I really like your pink jacket there, but that is so cool. I would wear that, and that's saying something. Okay. It says, those who look to him are radiant, and their faces are never ashamed. In fact, the, the, the Hebrew word look there is sparkle, which is quite in at the moment. Eh? It says, those who look to him sparkle. Have you ever seen somebody that might have been going through really difficult stuff, but there was a sparkle in their eyes? It says, those who look to him sparkle. And their faces are never ashamed. Psalm 123 says, I lift my eyes to you, to you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of slaves, get that? As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, and as the eye of a maid looks to the hand of her mistress, so we look to you, O Lord. There are times, I must not say there are times, there are aspects to our gaze on God that are like a son to a father, and there are aspects of our gaze on God that are like slaves to a master. Can you hear that? It's not one or the other. There is an aspect of to my relationship with God that I look on him as a slave looks to a master. And there are other aspects in my relationship with God where I look to him as a son looks to a father. Revelations tells us that the eyes of Jesus are like blazing fire. And yet when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and Jesus said, sell everything and follow me, and the guy went away, it says Jesus looked at him lovingly. See, there is an aspect to your relationship with God where if you look in his eyes, it's the loving look of a father. There's another aspect where there is the blazing fire of Lord and Master. There's an aspect to your gaze on him, which is son to father. There's another aspect to your relationship with God that is a slave to a master. And you need to hold both. You need to hold both, friends. And if we ask this question as we, as we wrap up the series on liberty, perhaps the more important question than getting free is staying free. It was really simple for the Hebrews to leave Egypt. It was really difficult for them to get into the promised land. It is a sim that guy that Ray and I prayed for that night and, and, and we cast that demonic uh, out of him. That part was the easy part. He had nothing to do with it other than roll on the floor. It was our faith 
and our prayer and our wrestling that set him free. But for him to live out that freedom, and when the drug and the addiction come knocking the next week and the next week and the next week, that was his wrestle. And as we wrap up this series, friends, my, my, my desperate plea with you is what kind of gaze do you need to have on God Almighty to keep you free, not just to set you free? If you and I would stay free, there is a conviction inside of us that I am a son and I am a daughter looking supremely confidently in the eyes of their father. But there is an aspect that I am as a slave looking to the hand of his master. I know that some of you are feeling a little bit uncomfortable with that. But Romans chapter 6, and Paul writes, and, and, and we love to quote chapters from the middle of Romans because they, they're just so full of the grace of God. And by the grace of God, Paul says, we are slaves of God. He uses that phrase. You have been set free from sin and we have become a slave of God. In fact, when Paul writes in the book of Ephesians and he addresses slaves, literal slaves, he says, just remember that you might be slaves to people, but you are firstly slaves to Christ. And the greatest way to stay free from any slavery is to know that you are first and foremost a slave of God. Now, there's, there's certain people that whenever I prep, they come into my mind. I can't even help it. Hannah Goldstone, every time I prep a message, I don't know where you are, I did see you there, but every time I preach, Hannah Goldstone, or, or prep, and I'm praying, it's like I'm just talking to Hannah Goldstone. I feel sorry for Hannah Goldstone. But, but just now, like, I was having a good look, is she here? And then I saw, yep, she's here, ripped jeans. So I thought, let me just go to the back, look, I'm, I'm wrestling with that thing. You know what it is? It's the sense of personalness. Because I went to the back, I said, Lord, sh Lord surely I can't just be about Hannah Goldstone. And I, I honestly felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, Ed, that personalness that you feel in your heart right now, so desperate for the Spirit of God to touch Hannah Goldstone, is what I feel for everybody. Suddenly it all made sense. Because I sometimes feel like, Lord, I just, there's such a personalness to this. But I just feel a tiny little portion of what God feels for everybody. This desire for everybody to walk and to live free. So, I want to just talk about two aspects of our slavery to God. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God percolates that, that, that little phrase that for some of you might be very uncomfortable right now. This, this notion that you could be a slave to God. I pray that he percolates that through your soul and it finds its right place. The first one is, we are bound to his word. We are bound to his word. John 15 uh, somewhere says this. He who obeys my commands is he who loves me. Let me say that again. He who obeys my word is he who loves me. Can I put that in very simple terms? You do not love God any more than you love his word. You do not respect God any more than you respect his word. You do not have faith in God any more than you have faith in his word. You don't have time for God any more than you have time for His Word. Your attitude towards His Word, according to Jesus, is your attitude towards Him. And some of us want to enjoy a relationship, an intimate, a close, and an open relationship with God 
thinking we will find it outside of a relationship with his word. And you won't. And you won't. Jesus told this parable in Matthew chapter 5. He said, nobody lights a lamp and then puts it under the bed. He said, but when you light a lamp, you give it a place of prominence so that it gives light to everything. And I want to ask you this morning, please, concerning the Word of God, that lamp that has been lit inside your life, is it shedding light or has it been stuck under the bed? I'm asking you, please, to take his word and to give it the place of prominence that you would give him. Some of the last words in the Bible, the last chapter of Revelation, God says, don't add anything to this Bible and don't take anything away from it. You know what that means? I doubt there's anybody in this hall tonight that is ever going to be able to tamper with the actual Bible. I I mean, maybe there's like a seriously clever theologian here and you're going to rewrite it one day and change all the the he's to it's and whatever, whatever to be, whatever. But I don't think that's going to happen. But you know how you subtract and you add to his word? Is by when he tells you something to manipulate it or disobey it or change it or delay it. Does it make sense? Debate it. The book of Jonah, chapter 1, God says to Jonah, just a very simple instruction. Go to that great city, Nineveh. Just, you can't mess with that. Just go to Nineveh. You know what happens, eh? He lands up in this big fish. Chapter 2 begins with him praying in the belly of the whale. And, and, and I love the one little phrase where it says, uh, Lord this, Lord that, Lord my head is covered with seaweed. I mean, that's probably the only time ever that anybody could pray that. Lord, my head is covered with seaweed. God delivers him. Chapter 3. What do you think God's word is? What's his word? Go to the great city of Nineveh. It hasn't changed. He failed. Got his head covered in seaweed. He comes back to God. God says the same thing. Some of us, God has spoken, and you have heard it. And when you were on your knees and clear-headed, it was clear. And then stuff happened. And then you think his word changes. Go back to what he said. Apply it. Implement it. And do it. He's not going to change his mind. It's not like he said one thing last week and this week it's all changed. Some of you got your heads wrapped in seaweed, it feels like, because God spoke, you didn't like it, he said go east, you went west, and now you've come back thinking God's going to be nice and change all his requirements. They're exactly the same. Does that make sense? Please hear me, friends. He says, don't tamper with my word. I've told you what to do, just do it. It's not going to change in three weeks' time. Bound to his word. We never sit over God's word, friends. We sit under it. We are never the judge of God's word. His word is the judge of us. Seriously, friends, some of you have heard God speak. Some of you know exactly what needs to be done. And you're thinking if you're just sitting that jolly fish's whale long enough, I mean, 
that whales belly long enough, it's going to change. Now, when that oak passes you out the back end, God's word will still be the same. You'll just feel like you came out the back end of a whale. Honestly. Number two. In our, this is supposed to be freeing, by the way. It is free. It's not supposed to be. It is free. See, the, the most free place you ever are is to be a slave to God. So number one, we're bound to his word. Number two, we are bound by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, and, and honestly, if you now think of the Holy Spirit, if I think of the Holy Spirit who, who I really try my best to attend, attend to my relationship with Him and my fellowship, it says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If I think of the Holy Spirit, I don't think of bondage. It's not, a, it's, it's not the association. Watchman Nee, and I haven't got time to read the uh, the. the the quote, but Watchman Nee, who was a pretty famous writer from a long time ago, said this about the Holy Spirit, that he called him the resident boss. Isn't that a beautiful picture? See, God the Father's boss, and God the Son is boss, and God the Holy Spirit is boss. But the one that's in you now, resident, the person of the Holy Spirit, he is the resident boss. Now, how many of you know that when a boss gives an instruction, it's not an opinion? How many of you know when the boss says something, it's not a suggestion? That's why he's the boss and you're the guy that he bosses. Okay? He says the Holy Spirit, God the Father's boss, God the Son's boss, and God the Holy Spirit is the resident boss. He's the one inside you that tells you what to do. And honestly, friends, I think that when it comes to the person of the Holy Spirit, myself included, the words that come to mind are more comfort and presence and glory and power than reign and rule. But the resident boss is inside you to reign and to rule, not just to comfort and demonstrate himself. Can you just let that sink in your soul the holy spirit is in you it says where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom the spirit of the lord is there is freedom now the lord is the spirit honestly friends i you can ask my wife the, this thing of a an awareness and a sensitivity and a, and an and intimacy with the Holy Spirit is probably the thing I desire more than anything in life. Genuinely. I just long to be able to hear Him. I long to be able to sense Him. I long for more and more and more of Him. To flow myself, our meetings, our churches. I just long for, I know that, that the Spirit gives life. The, the flesh is nothing. I know that. But there is this aspect to the Spirit of God ruling and reigning in us. Not just comforting and blessing and manifesting Himself. Do you know, do you know that, that the Bible says that, that we mustn't, what's not a, uh, what's the word? Don't grieve the, what's the other one? No, there's another one. Don't grieve, don't quench. Don't grieve. And, and the thing with those scriptures is that when we read them, is, is you kind of get the sense that poor Holy Spirit, he's quite a sensitive chap. And don't do anything to upset him. No, my friends, it is not about whether you offend the Spirit. It's about whether the Holy Spirit is going to come and offend you. Does that make sense? See, I think the Holy Spirit's quite offensive. Not in his comforting character, but in his lordship and his ruling and his reigning. I find it quite offensive. Because he leads me and causes me 
to do things and make decisions that me doesn't like. So let me take you to three phases and, uh, phrases, and, uh, and with this I end. In Acts chapter 16, verse 5 or 6, I can't remember, it says that Paul and his companions were traveling through Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had forbidden them. Everybody say forbidden. Now, I don't know what version your, say, your, uh, your Bible says. I'm oh, sorry, I don't know what word your version is using. But the Greek word that is used there is forbidden. The Holy Spirit forbade them to go there. Now, I don't know about you, but, but that's not a word that I associate with the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you? Now, I, I normally, when I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of leading. I think of, of gently going before me. I think more of a tugboat. The Holy Spirit, the tugboat, who kind of like just nudges me in the right direction, very, very gently, just lots of tires around the front so that he doesn't damage my outer skin. Just gently nudging me. There are times when he nudges, and there are times when he blasts. I can't even describe it. He's really not, not that concerned with how your outer skin feels. He forbade them. That's strong language, friends. Strong language. And some of us are doing stuff that if you just listen for half a second, you'll realize that the Holy Spirit has said, I forbid you for doing that. Not, I suggest you stop. Not, it would be helpful for you. That's the phrase we like using. It will be helpful for you. Or, if you're comfortable, do this. He just says, I forbid you for doing this. forbid you. Strong language, friends. Strong language. Chapter 18 of Acts. When Paul was at Corinth, also verse 5 or verse 6, I can't remember. But it says, Paul Timothy and some other guys arrived from somewhere, but it says that Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Occupied with the word. That sounds nice. Sounds something that Niles Day Lewis would do. Okay? Occupied with the word. If you go and look at the Greek words that are used there, it's the King James puts it like this. It says that. Paul was pressed in spirit. Testifying. You ever, you know what pressed in the spirit means? You ever had somebody grab a hold of your head? Vic, why don't you come here a sec, please? No, I'm not going to do anything horrible. This is, that, this is what it means. It means that you, you ever felt like somebody's just got a hold of your head and squeezing it there, like a chiropractor mode. Okay, it's like, it's pressure. Please hear me, friends. This is not a suggestion that the Holy Spirit made. It wasn't like Paul thought it was a good idea to preach. It was the Holy Spirit was pressing him. There was pressure to be there. I'll need you again, don't go. There, there is this aspect, Hannah Goldstein, to your relationship with God, because you were ducking off there. You could see your mind had drifted. There, Okay, there is this aspect to my relationship with the Spirit of God where He gets a hold of us and it feels, remember what Jeremiah said, he said, Lord, Lord, your word is like fire inside me. Your word, why does a volcano erupt, friends? Why does it, why does it come out the ground? Because of pressure. And why do you and I, do some of the things we do in God because we feel this pressure inside of us. Why do you go and visit that person in hospital that's dying? Nobody wants to do that because you feel the love of God pressured inside you. Acts chapter 20. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, and now I'm going to Jerusalem bound in the spirit. Some versions use compelled 
in the Spirit. Another version says, constrained in the Spirit. It's Acts 20, verse 22. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem bound. You look at the Greek word there, it literally means a prisoner to the Spirit. I am going to Jerusalem, a prisoner to the Holy Spirit of God. I pray, friends. People will ask this, ask, often ask this question, can a Christian be possessed or not? I hope that you are completely possessed by the Spirit of God. We say, can a Christian be bound? I hope you are completely bound by the Spirit of God. A few chapters later, Paul's minding his own business. A guy called Agabus comes up to him, takes his belt off. Don't worry, my pants are fine. He says, he says, the Holy Spirit's saying, that when you go to Jerusalem, they're going to bind you like this. The religious leaders are, leaders are going to bind you. And they're going to send you off to the Gentiles. And the people start crying. And they say, oh, Paul, don't go, don't go. They're going to bind you. And, and he says he was, he was broken by their crying. He says, I'm ready to be bound. I'm ready to die. Do you know why he was ready to be bound there? Because he was bound there. Some of us can't cope with that because it hasn't happened here yet. The Spirit has to get a hold of us, friends. So I'm going to ask you, please. I'm going to ask the elders to come stand with me in the front. And Robin, I left you come stand with me in the front, please. You come right now. I'm going to ask somebody to play the keyboard. And I feel, friends, seriously, that tonight, God just wants to very quickly, it's not going to be a long, drawn-out thing, but I feel like, see, when, when the king came with his seal, the wax was, or whatever it was, was soft. I hope that your heart is soft tonight. It was soft, and the king put his signet ring like that, and it left the seal of his ownership, the mark of his ownership. It left the mandate of his mission. Can we stand, please? And the seal for believers is the Spirit of God. And I feel like, honestly, that the Holy Spirit is just wanting to, a clear stamp. Some of you have made decisions and you're just vacillating the whole time. And God is saying, tonight is the, is the moment. And there are some of you that possibly you have never responded to Jesus as Lord. Tonight, tonight. So I'm going to ask you, please, those of you that are saying, Lord, I, I'm needing this seal of your spirit, just please come out right to the front right now. We're going to pray with you. Can we do that right now? Thank you, Caitlin. I knew you. God wanted to seal you. I know there's lots of you. I'm going to call you by name if I know you, so I'd rather just come so I don't have to do that. Thank you, Matt. Can we just start praying just for God's sealing work? His seal. Seal of the spirit of God. lips. Come on. Thank you, Father. Let's just carry on. I know God is wanting to do a work where He leaves the mark of His ownership. Just spread yourself a bit in here. It's this wonderful work of sealing. Wonderful work of sealing. God to leave his mark looking for God to leave his mark you can just back up we'll, we're just going to be quick in this prayer time thank you Father some of you that are saying oh, there's a decision I need to make it's like God said the first time go to Nineveh you didn't want to go and, and now you're kind of like just opening your ear and you're hearing the same word again and, and, and you don't have the courage and the strength to just come to front I just want to pray Spirit of God give you courage Spirit of God give you courage Lord Jesus. We lift you high, Lord Jesus. We lift you high, Lord Jesus. That your Holy Spirit would come now. Okay, it's coming in. Get it on. Get it on. There you go. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let us 
those of you that are uh, not up front, can you just, just worship God just where you are? And just ask Him where you are, please, just to fill you with His Holy Spirit, to seal you with His Holy Spirit. You've never spoken in tongues before? put it like this, those of you that do speak in tongues, just where you are, can you just just pray in tongues a little while? Please, would you do that? If you're the evening and you're saying, Lord, I, I want to, just ask Him right now where you are, please, right now where you are. Hannah, raise your hands, my girl. Just raise your hands. 